Greetings, geologists, and welcome to hominid evolution. So we're going to be looking at one of the most interesting parts of the geologic time scale, and that is how did we come about? Where do we fit in this realm of evolution in terms of organisms that diverge from some kind of single ancestor? And we know that we've looked back throughout geologic time since the Precambrian, earlier in the semester, and here you are at the very tail end of the Cenozoic in the Miocene looking at the start of human evolution. That is a really important test question, by the way, and I could tell you that even when I first started in school, human evolution was not thought to have started in the Miocene. It was thought to have started in the Pliocene. And I want to take a few moments to explain the significance of why we know that that's changed. You can read it in your textbook, sure, but it's based on data. It's based on fossil data and collection. And that's the beauty of paleontology is that the more records we find in the rock record in terms of fossils, and in this case, paleoarchaeology, we can piece together this remarkable story. So I think it's important to define those two terms before we start this lesson so you can kind of get it straight in your mind and carry on those educated conversations with people you know about what you've learned in this class and make sure that you're not mixing and matching terms that really are different. When we're referring to archaeology, we're referring to human artifacts, human stuff, the study of ancient civilizations. When you're looking at paleoarchaeology, you're looking at stuff that's fossilized, that's old enough to be a fossil, that is human-related. So just like in regular fossils, there are traces of human evidence. Things like pottery, arrowheads, things such as uh, stone tools they may have used. Those are all evidence. It's footprints, for that matter, are an example of traces that humans have left behind. So when we're talking about paleontology, we're referring to basically everything else that's vertebrate and invertebrate, and microscopic for that matter, that has existed that's not a human. So it's important to note that when you're talking about the two, people often say they're one and the same. And I can always think of when people talk to me about our geology field course, they're referring to saying, hey, you're going on an archaeological dig. I'm like, mm-mm. No, we're not. Uh, we're going on a paleontological dig. Two very different things. Exciting in either case. But there are very stringent laws for both the paleo and the archaeological set of standards on public lands. And it's part of what your assignment was in lab was to look at that and understand at least one of the sets of rules. Well, there's a whole different set of rules for excavating and uh, dealing with hominid remains. As you can imagine, hominid remains are rare, and they're rare for this reason. Until humans started burying their dead, it would have been like any other vertebrate. The chance of those bones getting fossilized would be very rare. So we don't have a great fossil record of early humans, and that's not to be surprised because our extinct ancestors, most of them didn't bury their dead. Our closest extinct ancestor was one of the first to do that. So as we go through this today, I just wanted to put those thoughts in your mind and get you to a point where you could appreciate that this science is subject to change as new fossils are discovered. And that's why it's so important to preserve the fossils that we have for scientific and education benefit, as well as public understanding of what's going on as we discover these new remarkable finds out in nature. So the common question I get in a face-to-face -face class about human evolution is, well, did we come from a chimp? So I've had you do work on cladograms this semester, and if you've read your chapter on human evolution, the primate evolution, you know that we fall in the same group, but we're not in the same exact subfamily. 
So I want to tell you they're our closest living relative in terms of DNA, but they are not, we did not come from chimpanzees, and you need to kind of get that out of your your vocabulary. I hear that regularly from just the general people that I talk to, and that's the first thing they want to harp on. And it you have to understand, though, that there's a lot of genetic DNA and skeletal sim similarities. As you did your skeleton comparisons, you saw that as you compared Homo sapiens, you compared, which is a modern human, you compared a Neanderthal, and then you compared a chimpanzee, and you saw very different uh, sits, uh, bones, for that matter, right? You saw different bones. You saw different alignment of those bones, but more importantly, you also saw some similarities. And so that's kind of the story of divergence that's happened with our family. Primates are divided into two suborders, prosimians and anthropoidae, and we fall in the latter. So when you think about things like lemurs, tree shoes, the animals that make up prosimians, they have some very unique characteristics, usually very big eyes. They're fairly small animals. They are very unique to certain geographic areas of the world, and our suborder, monkeys, apes, and humans and our extinct ancestors are part of that suborder. So you have to understand we're all related and that should be important to you as you visit zoos, as you visit museums, you need to take a look at those exhibits and take a moment of respect to realize that some of these suborders or even individuals within our suborders have been around a lot longer than we have. Prosimians are small. They have five digits on each hand and foot and claws and nails. They eat both plants and meat, so that makes them omnivores. They live in trees, arboreal, so that's important to note because that's, that's even a problem today when we think about extinctions and endangered species. That's their habitat. That's where they've been. Now, we know that these animals appeared uh, widespread by the Eocene. Like, we started getting primates back in the Paleocene. Test question for sure, right? They declined in significant numbers during the Oligocene, and I, so it's important to note because there were some substantial changes with plate movements, which changed the situation and habitat where these animals could have lived. Where would you find these guys today? You'd find them in continents like Africa, Asia, India, and of course Madagascar is probably the most famous. When you look at some of their attributes, they're kind of cute, but these funny looking faces and they have a unique set of characteristics that make them very uh, adapt to the environment in which they live. Anthropoids are divided into two families, Hylobatidae and then Hominidae. And so we fall in the latter of that, gibbons, siamangs, lesser apes. If you don't know what those are, you need to look them up. They have a distinctive look again that's unique and a different set of uh, skeletal features, at least certainly in different parts of their body, like their skull, their arms, their frame. But in our group and family, you will find the orangutans, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, us, meaning humans, but don't forget about our extinct ancestors. And that's what we're here today to learn about. Now, we know that hominoids evolved in Africa, or at least we suspect they do, from the oldest fossils that we have found. There are some controversy that I should point out that some scientists think that it might have actually had coevolution. In other words, that uh, convergent evolution was occurring, even parallel evolution for that matter, in other parts of the world, like in Asia, at the same time it was in Africa. So it's, to say that it all originated in Africa is maybe not 100% correct. But at the time where we are right now and today, I would say that's the general accepted theory. Our oldest fossils have been found in very specific places of Africa and in similar locations around that region. So we uh, certainly could find evidence that would change that. And I keep saying those kinds of things because I think it's important that we keep revisiting the fact that this science is going to change 
as often as we find new discoveries. And that's part of the beauty of science is that it does change when new information is found and new hypotheses are tested and they're proven or disproven. So let's look at this and talk about uh, where we think the ancestral anthropoids came from and why that's important. Ijopithecus is our ancestral anthropoid group that would be very important to the development of our extinct ancestors and ultimately to where we sit today as humans. So thinking about this as the continents had shifted by the late Eocene and we have movement of continents that are going northward, this changed the tropical and subtropical tree environment that was extensive during that time. If you recall, the Eocene is a very warm part of the ge geologic time frame, especially at the PETM, right? So you have to imagine things were very green, lots of lush rainforest or subtropical environments. As that began to change when plates began to move, that changed the landscape and the vegetation. So fauna and flora are going to adjust as these continents begin their movements. And that's going to lead to more savanna and grassland type environments. That is critical to understanding the need for radiation in anthropoid groups. So hominoids are going to fill these niches as savannas and grasslands open and their life in the trees may linger for a while meaning they'll probably spend time in trees, but their arboreal existence will eventually turn into terrestrial. So they'll move from the trees and start expanding into new habitats like grasslands and savannas. On the apes, they're part of our family, as you know. Adaptive radiation occurred as hominoids and their populations expanded. But as they did, they also became isolated from one another. This goes back to looking at allopatric speciation from evolution. So when Africa collided with Europe during the Miocene epoch, this allowed for migration between these new groups of animals that have been isolated. So adapted radiation, allopatric speciation has occurred, the populations are starting to develop new characteristics, and now we have a plate collision allowing for these animals to start their migration process. So this is going to cause two groups to evolve that would give rise to the modern day hominids. Dryopithecine is the group that forms the most closely related lineage to apes, chimpanzees, and humans and our extinct ancestors. So they are going to be kind of that branch that we come off of on a cladogram and they represent that starting point that's going to diverge into these different groups in which we fall in one of those. So hominids is a term that's used to describe the subfamily homininae. The term that's commonly used to describe subfamily homininae, that is what hominids are referred to. So that includes us, the gorillas, our extinct human ancestors, chimpanzees, all of those things. So it's an all-inclusive term, so when you're using it, you can't just refer to it as, as humans. I've had some students say, yeah, I've had anthropology professors really focus and only on primates and not so much on humans. We have to understand that's such a huge part of where we came from. So you have to have that conversation when you're looking at human evolution because you cannot leave that out. Hominini is subdivided again into three separate lineages and here is Hominini right here and then you're going to have what ends up being humans or homos and pan, which is going to be this one and this one, and then you get the gorillas. So what I'm telling you is that we have actually divided, and you need to look at this little cladogram right here and realize how close we are on the family tree to chimpanzees. Hominins are, are uniquely different from the other two hominid groups because of very specific skeletal features. We can even say DNA and genetic evidence now that we have that technology, but here's a handful of those things. I think the first one that's important is the bipedal issue. So when we first started, 
to become bipedal, something had to change. And I would like you to think back to your activity where you had to compare the skeletons of the three different hominids. And one of the things you should have noticed of chimpanzees that was different from the other two human species was how the neck or the vertebrae came into the back of the skull. So it came in at an angle for them, it comes in straight under our skull casing for our humans. If you were to find a bipedal organism that's a specific opening, and that opening, that bone structure, where it is on the skull can immediately determine what we're looking at in terms of if it's the animal bipedal or not. So that's one of the first things you look at if you find a skull. That's one reason skulls are such valuable finds in the fossil record is they can immediately tell you just a lot about the animal simply, not just because of the shape of the skull, but where this particular opening might be. Our brains had to be reorganized. That almost sounds funny, doesn't it? But because of the size of our human brains that gradually increased from our extinct ancestors, that had to be compartmentalized. It had to be packed into a space, into a more efficient use of that space. So that's one key characteristic that's different from something like chimpanzees or gorillas. We have a reduced face, so if you'll think of a gorilla, and I'm talking about size here and shape of the bones, and you compare it to humans and you think about how different that has changed, if you look at the three groups, at current, side by side, you will see a distinctive difference in the morphology of the face. We had reduced uh, canine teeth. If you look at uh, chimpanzees, for example, they have teeth that are distinctively different from ours. Apes do too. And so we've reduced some of those sharp teeth because our eating habits were different. And that goes to the omnivore eating habits. Not that these animals are not, but our eating habits are distinctively different than theirs. One of the big key elements that separates us is our hands, okay? So when you were comparing skeletal differences between these animals, one of the things most of you noted was the thumb and the arms were different, right? So you think about, you can touch your finger to all five of your, like your thumb to all five of your fingers. That gives you enhanced dexterity. Well, the other two groups don't have that. So that's a, a long-term change that's going to happen in the human evolution as we first started evolving and diverging away from our ancestral group. This change was not as noticeable as it is today. So over a period of generations, as these features and traits were needed for living the way that we do, or the way that they have moved from trees to grasslands and savannas, this evolved as a trait necessary in order to live in the, in the environments that they were. As they began to fill habitats, these new habitats, these features would slowly evolve. And you can see that evolution change in the different species that we're fixing to look at. So the separation of groups for these is distinctive in terms of fossil evidence. We know that the hominin and chimpanzee groups separated somewhere from gorillas around 8 million years ago. And then it's generally accept accepted that hominins separated from chimpanzees somewhere around 7 million years ago. So our closest living relative, again, is the chimpanzee, right? I mean, you could argue that about Neanderthals, that some people have some percentage of DNA of Neanderthals. Let's take that off the table for a minute. I'm talking about living groups of our family, if you want to call it per se, of gorillas, uh, which is the, the apes, our group, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. So in that context, I think that 7 million year time frame is super important because it will become clear to you as we go through this process why that's so important. Cyhalanthropus chadensis is one of the most important fossils you're going to learn about today of our extinct human species. 
This is the oldest known hominin found to date. It ex likely was alive at some point close to the division of chimpanzees from hominins. And you need to think about the significance of that because that means our common ancestor that we know about that we just heard a few minutes ago is still in the picture, right? So we got this thing going where we're, we're branching off and we're starting to diverge. And this ancestor lived in West Central Africa. And we find these fossils there. One distinctive feature separates this group from the others. Foramen magnum. That's that opening I was talking about at the base of the skull. That's the key feature that shows us that these animals had changed their living habits. I'm not saying they didn't still live in trees or they didn't exist in trees. What I'm telling you is they had a body plan that was different from their prior types that enabled them to be bipedal. This is a huge thing because it's going to set the stage for these organisms to continue to diverge and change over time. But this one feature, as opposed to having the skull come in like this, it's going to come in like this under the skull, that changes how the animal lived. That's a clue. And it's a giant clue to our ancestors of how they lived. What were some other changes? Really, all we have in terms of fossil material is crani uh, cranial. So in other words, we have head stuff. We have head uh, fossils that we found from this guy. And we know a couple of things about them. First, that the hole was at the base of the skull where the vertebrae and the spinal cord come into the brain. That's the most important thing. They had a different type face also. Their nose was flat. They had very prominent brow ridges, which are typically seen in homo species. That's something unique. This is an artist's depiction of this particular species of hominids. And of course, it's an artist depiction based on fossils. So we can't be 100% sure because we don't have skin. We don't have that kind of thing to be able to tell you what they look like. A Warren tugenensis is the next group that came about around 6 million years ago. Now keep in mind we have a very poor fossil record of these early groups of hominids, very few fossils indeed. This guy is often referred to as the Millennium Man. What we've discovered of the bones of these guys, one bone in particular is important and it has to do with the leg bone. These guys uh, really were not very big, they're the size of about a chimpanzee. So if you've seen chimpanzees, of course, we've changed our size and length and dexterity from what they have. They guy, these guys had smaller teeth. They had very thick enamel that would have been used um, for a different type of feeding habit than modern humans have today. We know, based on some of the fossils that we have, that these guys still had traits that enabled them to climb trees, but yet they moved on land as well. What would be one of the first clues that they were bipedal? I need to come back to that with every single early hominid and you think about where that vertebrae and spinal cord comes into the brain. Artipithecus cadaba is another famous fossil often referred to as Arty. So Arty existed some point between 5.8 million and 5.2 million years ago. Definitely bipedal had a body and a brain size close to that of a modern chimpanzee. And the brain size is important because that's going to start to change very soon. Interesting things about their fossils. One of the important fossils that we see for Artie is they had a large toe that's broad. So I'd like you to look at your toes for a minute and determine, do you have a big toe? I think we would all say, mm-hmm unless it's been removed, you still have your big toe, right? A robust appearance suggesting that this particular toe was used for pushing off. So I actually want you to get up and try to, to walk for a second and realize how important that, that front toe is, that big toe. The only fossils found of this species are just a few of the skull and near body parts that we have found in teeth. So we don't have a lot to go on for Artie. Hopefully more of this fossil group will be found to give us more clues about how they lived and what they look like. Artipithecus ramidus 
This is a unique guy that lived approximately 4.4 million years ago and had some defining characteristics. They had a more dexterity, ability to move their hands for grasping, not just for holding and climbing, but for grasping things. So that should tell you that we're getting a need for gathering and so forth of materials on the ground. They had a foot with an opposable big toe. Sounds familiar, right? And again, they had some really important feature that tells us they spent a lot less time in trees. Here it is. Their foot bones lacked a, the morphology or the joints necessary to be flexible to climb like an ape or a chimpanzee in, in trees. You and I don't have those uh, abilities. I mean, unless we have some kind of weird genetic mutation that allows us to do that, we would not walk the same way everybody else would. So this is definitely indicating bipedal characteristics. So basically, one of the important finds for Ramatus is this. We have found a crushed we, meaning scientist, not me, of course, but scientists have found a crushed pelvis that indicates that these animals, after they reconstructed it, had some of the necessary characteristics for being able to climb trees with limited ability, but being able to walk on two legs on land. That leads us to the Australopithecus group. So we describe this term from Australopithecus as a group of, of assortment of extinct ancestors to modern humans, and they are distinctively different from Homo species. So as we go through them, I am going to cover most, but not all. And we will talk about some of the characteristics of each of the Australopithecus and describe what's unique about each and every one. Australopithecus anamensis is the oldest known species of Australopithecus beginning to appear in the fossil record around 4.2 million years ago. They were between 1.3 and 1.5 meters tall and got between 33 and 50 kilograms. So they're much smaller than modern humans are today. The fossils of Australopithecus and Artipithecus are found in similar areas of Africa, indicating good evidence that likely Artipithecus evolved into Australopithecus anamensis. So they're kind of the oldest and everybody's going to diverge from them. So what's going to happen is Anamensis is going to be the ancestral species to Afarensis. Australopithecus Afarensis lived from about 3.9 million years ago to 3.0 million years ago. The members of this species range from about 1 to 1 and a half meters tall, and they got between 29 and 45 kilograms. But they had a brain a little bigger than a chimpanzee. So we've got a little bit of improvement here in terms of brain size. Fully bipedal, and they still retained ape-like features with the massive brow ridges, the forward gutting jaw that makes them unique, that looks like that. They had enameled molars that enabled them to eat certain kinds of food that were very acidic and very tough to chew, such as fruits, nuts, seeds, whatever, roots. This guy is going to be the ancestral species to Australopithecus uh, africanus, and then which is going to lead to the homo side of the branch of the tree where we come from. There is a side group that you will learn about called Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus boisei. And some, and many archaeologists, paleoarchaeologists, would put them in their separate own unique group, Paranthropus, uh, Robustus, and Boisei. So these are had unique characteristics that we'll look at and we'll discover why they're different. Well, you can't have a conversation about Afarensis without investigating the most famous of all Australopithecus fossils, which is Lucy. First of all, I'm going to bust the myth that Lucy is a female. Obviously, she's female or male, but I'm going to tell you we don't know which one she is. So I'm going to say she's question mark. And I'll keep referring to her as she out of respect for the name that she got, Lucy. We'll get to how she got that in just a minute. Nevertheless, her remains are found in an area in Afar, Ethiopia, and 
when you're at a dig site, typically bones are numbered and the site's numbered and it is given uh, a card and identification tag, like a chain of custody that kind of allows for those bones to be put into a study of how they were found in the ground, at what angle they were found, so strike and dip matter, all of those things, the type of rock, all of that stuff is important to telling the overall story for scientific merit about where these fossils came from. The same would be true with dinosaurs, the same would be true with any vertebrate, right? Even in invertebrates for that matter, the same applies. So the AL specimen 288-1 is simply her designation from where she was found at the dig site. So keep in mind that you may not think that a 40% skeleton is a big deal from afarensis. It's huge deal. Remember, they didn't bury their dead. So to find a specimen that is 40% complete of an individual is, I mean, off the charts huge. Now her bones travel and go to various different museums and I have seen them at the Houston Museum of Natural History and that's a pretty big deal, you know, to be able to get to see them. If you ever get the chance to see them on display, you should go. Make the trip, even though it may be inconvenient, go see it while you can because this is a pretty remarkable specimen. Now I mentioned that we couldn't determine whether she's a he or a, a she. Why? Let's look at the skeleton and discover why. I had you compare those skeletons in a lab of a Neanderthal, a modern human, and a chimpanzee. And just about every single student home end on the importance of the pelvic area, because you had a question you had to answer about that, right? Well, you have to have both sides of the pelvic girdle in order to determine gender. Same is true in any vertebrate. So we don't have it. We only have half of the, the pelvic joint. So you can't determine if it's a he or a she. So how did the name Lucy come up? Good question. So I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of these paleoanthropologists who discover this remarkable set of bones, right? I think you would be in a celebratory mood after having discovered one of the most important archaeological discoveries of ancient human fossils that you might have had a party, okay? Assuming they had a party, which we know that's the case, a song came on, a famous song by the Beatles to be exact. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds came on and that's how the name stuck. So if you're wanting to know where the name Lucy came from, it came from the Beatles. Just by accident, because that's what was playing the night of the celebration. So that's how Lucy came to be. But what do you need to know about Lucy? She's 40% complete. We don't know it's a she or a he. We do know a lot about the bones. She was she was buried in some kind of a rock layer that was a sedimentary rock layer with some, some ash and even some blood deposits. That's a lot of information right there about how this person lived. So important to note that this was an aphorensis, and it's the most complete specimen of an aphorensis we have to date. So we're looking at Australopithecus africanus. You need to think about how they're going to be different from aphorensis. Remember, aphorensis gave rise to africanus. Now, there's some really important things about africanus. They live from 3.0 to about 2.3 million years ago, but their body plan, very similar to Afarensis with a few major differences. One of the major differences is in the face and the brain casing. Flatter face, bigger brain casing for their larger brain, but they had smaller teeth. Interesting facts though, based on the bones that have been discovered thus far, it appears they didn't have quite the right skeleton for as effective as bipedal long-term behavior as aphorensis did. Doesn't mean they weren't bipedal, they certainly were. What's the first thing you would look for for that? Hopefully you're remembering the opening, uh, the foramen uh, magnum, which is that opening in the back of the skull. If it's coming straight under the skull, that's what allows the spinal cord and the uh, process to fit into the back of your head. Now, keep in mind that Africanus has definitely been linked to the evolution of homo species. There's still two more groups of Australopithecus that are considered to be a unique 
side group and they are important because they have distinctive weird characteristics that are different from the rest of Australopithecus species. Here they are. The boy's eye lived from 2.6 to 1.0 million years ago. And I'm going to also point out how important that is when we start to think about the crossover that there could be multiple types of hominid species living simultaneously as we go through the Homo lineage. The robustus lived from 2.0 to 1.2 million years ago. They're both very similar in size, about 1.1 to 1.4 meters, and got between 32 and 49 milli uh, kilograms. What's important about these guys are some really weird facial features and teeth features. They had flatter faces, a crown on their skull right up here. So there's this like little angle thing that allows for more joints or places hooking actually for where ligaments and tendons and muscles could hook on to allow this thing to be stronger. So they probably ate coarser food. They ate tougher food. They ate materials that enabled them to have these kind of really large teeth and unique uh, facial features and structures that we don't see in any other Australopithecus or Homo species. They are both ex thought to have gone extinct somewhere in the realm of by one million years ago. Well, that brings us into an important species, Australopithecus sediba. So what's important about this guy is that fossils from a very famous cave have been found that is so complete that it's allowed for multiple skeletons, not just one, of what these organisms would have looked like, our ancient ancestors, around the times that Homo species began to evolve. Some of their features retain very Australopithecus-like structures, others are very Homo-like. So let's look at the Australopithecus similarities. They had teeth and the length of their arms and legs and narrow chest. That's going to also tell you that they had some features that definitely correlated to Australopithecus, but they had some fundamental changes that make them unique and similar to Homo. The functional changes of their pelvis indicated that they walked upright. Of course, they're going to all hum humans, ancient humans, have that hole at the base of their skull, so that's sim similar to everybody. The measures of their humerus bone, and the humerus bone's actually this thing right here. It's your long arm before it hits your funny bone, and actually you know, that's where the humerus comes from is um, when you think of a humerus, they're arm bones, and people always think, oh, I hit my funny bone. Well, that's where the name humerus came from, uh, is <laughs> that's just the irony of some of the things that got named, right? Nevertheless, the, the strength of the humerus and the femur, the femur is your big thigh bone that connects to your hip joint, shows a more human-like mode of movement than we saw in Australopithecus. So this is a super time to take a break, geologist, and we'll come back for the second half of human evolution where we look at the homo species as exactly where we come from, and we'll investigate our extinct ancestors and talk about where we are today. See you soon. Bye.